Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special event. As most of you know, this talk was originally planned to take place in person to kick off the Discard Studies Conference that was held at NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study from September 15th to 17th. The conference brought together scholars from the humanities and the social scientists working at the heart of this emerging interdisciplinary field of discard studies in exploring research, art, and activism that focuses on waste and the forces that render certain objects, practices, and populations disposable. Organized by myself, Mohammed Rafi Arafin, and Robin Nagel of the NYU Discard Studies Collaborative, and hosted by NYU Gallatin, the conference included five research panels and four keynote lectures. Co-sponsors included the NYU Office of Sustainability, the NYU Center for the Humanities, Global Design NYU, the Urban Democracy Lab, NYU Liberal Studies, and the Department of Environmental Studies. The conference was held in conjunction with an exhibition in the Gallatin Galleries curated by Keith Miller titled Merle Latterman Euclid's Chasing the Humming of Life from September 15th to October 13th. The exhibition features 11 video works, including the video version of Manifesto for Maintenance Art 1969, Proposal for an Exhibition Care 1969, which was created specifically for this exhibition. The exhibition also showcases Euclid's seminal works, Touch Sanitation, in which she shakes the hands of 8,500 New York City sanitation workers and the Snow Workers Ballet representing the snow plow operators of the Japanese city of Tokamachi. We encourage everyone in the New York area who hasn't had the chance to see the show to come down for a visit before it closes after tomorrow. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to quickly thank our co-sponsors, the two Gallatin deans, Suzanne Wofford and Victoria Rosner, who supported this conference, the Gallatin events staff, especially Teresa Anderson and Rachel Plutzer, the theater staff, especially Jen Burge and Tracy Clapper, the curator of the Gallatin Galleries, Keith Miller, the gallery student workers and volunteers, as well as the different Discard Studies Conference intern, Ariana Juarez, and the Gallatin communications team, especially Casey Traumer. This has been a truly wonderful conference and exhibition, and we couldn't have done it without all of this wonderful support. Now I want to introduce our speaker. Meryl Latterman Euclid received a BA in International Relations from Barnard College and an MA in Interrelated Arts from New York University. Since 1977, she has been the official unsalaried artist in residence in the City of New York Department of Sanitation. Her works are in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum, the Guggenheim Museum, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Migros Museum Zurich, the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum in Hartford, Smith College Museum in Northampton, and the Jewish Museum in New York City. She's represented by the Ronald Feldman Gallery in New York. Euclid's exhibits and lectures internationally and has received honorary doctorates from the Rhode Island School of Design, the Maine College of Art, and in May 2019 from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago where she gave the commencement address. Two books have recently been published about her work, Merle Latterman Euclid's Maintenance Art in 2016 and Seven Works Ballet in 2015. In addition to her solo show at Gallatin, she's uh, currently featured in two international group shows at the Boston Institute for Contemporary Art and the Tingley Museum in Basel, Switzerland. Euclid is also engaged with the Fresh Kills Park Project and is currently busy designing a permanent nature viewing platform and two related earthworks at the former landfill as part of the city's Percent for Art program. She is an internationally recognized performance, video, and conceptual artist, as well as public thinker, whose per performances, sculptural installations, and writing span more than five decades. Her work explores issues at the heart of contemporary society, gendered relations of care, cultures of maintenance and labor, the creative possibilities and political address of infrastructure, the metabolism and sustainability of the urban landscape. 
It's a deep personal pleasure to be able to introduce Eucalys, whose art and writing has been deeply inspiring for my own research and feminist praxis. Her now iconic works are foundational to discard studies, placing the spotlight on the often invisible people and processes that maintain and care for other bodies and ecologies in a deep interrogation of the dialectics of waste and value. There's so many aspects of her work that are groundbreaking. It's focus on embodiment, it's harnessing of the materiality of urban life, it's whimsical and playful critique that's also powerfully capable of illuminating some of the most powerful forms of both dispossession and of refusal. I, I, I don't wanna to talk too long. There's a, a million wonderful things we can say about our speaker, but we wanna let her speak for herself. Uh, her talk will be followed by comments from Gallatin professors, Eugenia Kissin and Keith Miller, and then Q and A from the audience. So I wanna welcome Meryl Latterman Eucalys and her keynote talk titled, Who Cares? Welcome. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, this has been a long time coming to be. Um, I was supposed to give this in 3D during the fabulous Discard Studies Conference in September. And I, after two years, two and a half years of being super duper careful, I came and my husband, we both got whopped with COVID. Uh, really bad. Um, so here I am. I'm very grateful to all of you at Gallatin and the Discard Studies colleagues for inviting me. I feel like I have a home with, home with you. Um, so let's get started. I became an artist to be free, to win the levels of freedom that I received from my Western culture artist heroes, freedom to act within the artwork from my uncle Jackson Pollock, freedom to name and rename from my grandfather Marcel Duchamp, freedom to pass from one dimension to another, from my uncle, Mark Rothko. You might notice the genders. I struggled for years to win, win this freedom as artist. Then in 1968, out of free choice, desire, and great blessing, Jack and I had a baby. I became a mother maintenance worker. I discovered that Jackson, Marcel, and Mark didn't change diapers. I had fought so hard to get their freedoms, I fell out of their picture. I was so powerful, giving life and keeping life alive, learning the hum, of getting from one breath to the next and learning the mind bending boredom of repetitive task work. At times I felt as if my well-educated brain was going to blow out of the top of my head. Goodbye, it was saying to me as I changed yet another diaper. I wasn't made for this. There she was on the changing table, smiling and gurgling at me. I love this baby, madly, twirling. And I was discovering every teeny element of the external world with her as she discovered it. I was in a full crisis. I felt like two people in the same body the free artist and the mother maintenance worker, twirling. I was never working so hard in my life, yet people who met me pushing my baby carriage would ask me, do you do anything? Falling, falling, twirling. Maintenance in 1968 had no words, 
no language, no place, no culture. I was dumped outside Western culture. I was so angry and I felt so entitled too. I had had the best education in Western culture. I'm supposed to be powerful in public. Click an honest to God epiphany. This became clear. If I am the boss of my freedom, then I name maintenance art. I can collide freedom into its opposite and name necessity art. Why? Because I am the artist and I say so. I, me, as artist must survive. It is art and art history that needs to change, get in line. It all came together in one sitting when in a quiet rage, I wrote the manifesto for maintenance art in October, 1968. The manifesto is four pages. It is a sculpture that is a text. It proposes three streams that flow into each other, personal maintenance, societal maintenance, especially in cities, earth maintenance, the third. Look next door at Gallatin, inside and outside on Washington Place, you see the Maintenance Art Fest Manifesto, this document moving slowly, slowly, so you can read it easily inside and outside. My first job after this realization to re-see the world, to start all over again at the beginning, like my baby. Please note, this is not the art of the happy cleaner. My ambivalence is extreme, twirling. The thing about an epiphany is, it, is that it is not narrow. It blazes, it radiates outward. I call necessity art. The manifesto, is a world vision and a call for revolution for the workers of maintenance. These are the workers who take care, the workers of survival. Women, the ancient uninvited maintenance class who have forever until now and still now this very day have been told are still told, this is who you are, this is what you must do. And together with non-gendered service workers, look around. That's most of the people in the whole world. Together, if organized in coalition, we could reshape the world. Low. This, I want to say a few images in my imagination from the exhibition I was proposing in this manifesto called Care. It needs a whole museum. The sound slides down and up all four floors, at least, of the museum. Personal, the first floor. The space is almost empty. It's quiet. A woman is sleep sweeping. The sounds of her sweeping are amplified throughout the main floor. She cleans, she dusts, she washes, she cooks, she feeds visitors, she washes the dishes. All these sounds are amplified. 
throughout the first floor and wandering up the stairs, the museum, when you enter, looks empty of art. Her working is the work of art. Two, the second floor, their tables and chairs, sounds of 50 different people with all different kinds of jobs being interviewed about how do you keep going? How do you keep alive? At first, all these voices produce cacophony. But when you ar arrive, approach one individual, you can hear pride at doing a good job at keeping going. Or you can hear loss, sadness, anger, what happens to my dreams when you spend all your time keeping going? What happens to my freedom? Flow creates from a sound, created from the sound work, a kind of opera of all these different voices swelling swelling the space with sounds of pride, anger, loss, boredom, dreams, my freedom, my dreams. When, when do I get that? When? And the third and fourth floor, that's when the museum becomes a fulcrum of transformation. Discarded materials are delivered to the museum and enter every day. Piles, piles in transformation. The work of transformation is ongoing every minute. Then the materials, healthy and robust, return to the city. Hey, this is an artwork. This is a new idea of what is a museum. All three parts flow into the other. Sounds flow up and down. They make together a whole picture. Imagine, I proposed this to the Whitney in 1969. They sent me a half piece of paper. They were very ecological and said to me, try your ideas on or in a gallery before approaching a museum. Imagine if the entire Whitney or other museum, the entire one became this whole picture of maintenance, of taking care. Washing, 1974, a maintenance art performance. The sidewalk in Soho on Wooster Street in front of the old AIR gallery, one of the first feminist galleries I'm in Lucy Lepard's C7500, a traveling feminist artist exhibition between 1973 and 1974. I bring old sheets from home. I yell every hour on the hour, north, east, south, west. The cleanliness of this area is now being maintained as art from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. It will be normalized at 5.01 p.m. I begin washing. Next. Soho was partially industrial and much dirtier in 1974. 
very dirty. I am in trouble. It is so dirty. I'm running out of rags. The sidewalk is eating them up. The gift, a superintendent, the manager of a whole factory across the street has been watching me and listening to me for some time. He sees that I am in trouble. He arrives. He doesn't ask, what is this? Why is this art? Instead, he walks right into my art, bringing me an armful of new, tough, industrial rags. Here, that's the only word that passed between us. He accepts me as real and enables me to keep working. I think from that point on, the deal of my artist changed, opening myself to become interdependent with others, with a complimentary offer for them to participate in shaping the work, not simply to receive it. This idea became real at that moment. I am so moved that I tried to incorporate the gift into my body. I wrapped his rags around and around to become my own foot and leg, wanting to turn my body, not just my hands, into a cleaning force. I become mop foot. He has entered my soul. I can keep working. I wipe out the visitor's footsteps as soon as he enters the space. Maintenance can become fascism. I track him right into the gallery. Like when your mother says, after she just washed the whole floor, if you get this dirty, I'm going to kill you. I stand there facing two guys who even avoid coming into the territory I have taken over. We stare at each other. This is 1974. These guys look groovier than the super. They look artier. But from here on, I belong with the super. I am in a new world of maintenance with actually most of the people in the world trying to keep going. From 1969 to 1976, I made many different maintenance art performances with me and a few others, scaling up a bit even to 300 workers in a skyscraper in New York City. After a great review of this work on In the Village Voice by David Bourdon, I get a call from Francis Richards, the New York City Department of Sanitation Commissioner's assistant. How would you like to make art with 10,000 people? She asks. I'll be right over, I reply. To me, this is the world of maintenance's major leagues. They're calling me up. The city was deep in fiscal crisis in the mid-1970s, right then. Touch sanitation. After one and a half years of research, 
listening to and learning from sanitation workers, I begin the performance ritual called touch sanitation. I will make 10 circling sweeps around New York City. I refuse to experience through sampling the abstract way a social scientist comes to know something only if I immerse myself in sanitation's wholeness can this art become real. I will float through the entire system's everyday reality to face all the workers, to travel to every sanitation facility in New York City, garages, section offices, mechanical sweeper garages, snow operations, repair shops, Borough commands, incinerators in those days, landfills, many of them in those days, headquarters, the whole system. I desire to make art, utterly public art, injected into the city's bloodstream everywhere. I will face each of 8,500 sanitation workers shake hands and say to each person, thank you for keeping New York City alive. Every day I go out, a telex is sent from headquarters to every sanitation location all over town so people can track me from all over town. I spend at least an eight hour, often a 16 hour shift, modeling my performance art time on the eight hour work shift, making increasingly fiery speeches at roll call. I'm not here to watch you there were many people watching them. I'm not here to study you, to judge you. There are many people judging them. I am here to be with you. All the shifts to walk out the whole city with you. So thank you. This is the South Bronx on the second day of touch sanitation. This is a garage of Brooklyn. Then I walk out some of the thousands of curb miles with the Sandmen, Sandmen, at that time still an all male workforce. We eat together sometimes on the curb because many restaurants won't serve Sandmen inside, often in terrible section stations. This is in Queens. Much of the time, I listen. It is risky and possibly dangerous. As Robert Smithson would call it, this expedition slash exploration is a taboo situation. It is also thrilling. But there is fury and fear in the garages and locker rooms, fiscal crisis, a strong move to sell sanitation to the private carters. The city's workplace, workforce, is reduced by 60,000 workers. It is that bad. Many people are in a panic that they'll lose their homes, lose everything. Every day, 
I face strangers. Often they are shouting. It is scary, but I'm fueled by my own personal fury as a mother maintenance worker at how maintenance workers, both women as the destined and sanitation workers, keepers of the exterior city as home, are not seen, not heard, not honored. That's it. We are joined in anger. I'm trying to create a grand coalition, a service workers coalition. That's most of the people in the world. Time to rupture this whole ancient, ridiculous bubble. This is Staten Island. It's 6 a.m. roll call again. This gets complicated. Do you know why everyone hates us? Many ask me, why? They think we're their mother. They think we're their maid. As if it were obvious, if they were women, would it be okay to hate them, would it? Who are they telling this to? Surely this feminist artwork aiming to build the ultimate inside-outside coalition needs a little more work. I meet a sanitation worker. I see deep in his eyes what I have come to call the gates of acceptance. I see him looking at me, and then I see his gates opening up. He has decided, what the hell, I'll trust her. I'll tell her what it does to me inside when people think we are part of the garbage. I feel at home and he fully intends for me to pass this along to others as an artwork. Follow in your footsteps, a part of the performance that grew along the way. I copy their moves on the street to place myself in the same position of public exposure with the audience usually watching, often criticizing, but hidden behind the curtain, behind the Venetian blind. I also like it because it often cracks them up. A dance develops. We're dancing in the street. This is what the beginning of what turned into seven work ballets with workers all over the world. It continues to all the sites of degraded land. I thought the performance itself would take three months. It ends up taking 11 months. It is hard on my own family. My seven-year-old son comes home from school, catching hell from his friends. He asks me, are there many garbage artists like you? I asked him the other day, he's almost 50 years old this month, how he responded to the kid who said, your mother's a garbage artist. He told me, I didn't say anything. I slugged him. Every day, I send out a telex saying where I will be to touch sanitation so people all over town know how far I've come. It's 3 a.m., 10 months after I started. I arrive at a dank little godforsaken section office in the Bronx. I ask myself, so tired, 
what are you doing this for? Then the foreman says, I've been tracking you all year. I had said I'm going to do this and they have been mapping me doing it all over the city. I don't run away. I keep coming back just like they do. That's what binds us. That is our power. A human being always has the freedom to say no. But a human being also has the freedom to say yes. Open your hand. The art is to create a dismapping of the formal city and to create a remapping of the entire living city from its underbelly up, the allness of it, only via the ineffable individuality of each worker with everyone with whom we are utterly dependent now inside the picture. This is the beginning of democratic public culture. Here are a few works from my 50 year survey show at the Queens Museum in 2016, 2017. This is called Ceremonial Arts Honoring Service Workers. The image source close to my heart is a photograph by Henri Cartier-Bresson from 1968. Like the beloved LA of trees, along my childhood home on Newton Street in Denver, Colorado. You can be outside and inside the dappled sunlight at the same time. This is an image of how I work embedded at the central repair shop. See the garbage truck in the background, the other trucks embedding stiffening gloves, stiffening each glove to be used in a ceremonial arch honoring service workers. Arch facts. Collaboration, 12 different New York City infrastructure agencies on a steel arch structure 5,000 dirty work gloves signed, hand stiffened, tagged with each agency wired to steel rod branches. Six columns of the city's infrastructure. In the foreground sanitation column, many kinds of measuring. They measure every pound, every pound. And the base is a resized curb broom from a mechanical sweeper. Fire department, subways, New York City Police Department, transportation. This is the MTA. Pick and axe, pickaxe and, and hose. That's the fire department. The interior of the arch with 50 work lights pulsing from the MTA, the fire department and the police department. And on the top, a profile of gloves. Here we are inside the main gallery of the Queens Museum. On the Great Wall, 30 feet high and over 100 feet long is my print installation. You are looking at one year of work time of care. I believe that sanitation, besides cleaning the streets, removing the waste and recyclables and moving the snow, 
really is a visual philosophy of time. You are looking at one entire year's time in one shot. The first layer of the print is a wall of clocks. Sanitation is lunatic about counting every hour, every hour. Every one of these clocks has only eight hours, a work shift, a humane Western invention. You could have my brain and body for eight hours, but not more or repay overtime. Behind, behind the clocks on these individual prints is a second layer, a collage of thousands of sanitation work forms, gazillions of work forms signed every day by individual workers. The third layer of the prints are the gradual shifting colors of the four seasons floating across the entire wall. Work continues. Note that winter is not white, but rather snow emergency red orange, like the snow plows. This is one year. We can do this a whole year in our hands. It says we have made a huge decision as a culture that we have the right and the operational expertise and the work power to live in the present, in today. We deserve to do the work that can maintain the present. We don't have to work, walk around on the horse droppings and waste of yesterday, always dragging the day before under our feet. New York City used to be like that, no more. You're looking at the very expensive decision that we have made and it reflects an aspect of our society's power and intelligence and wealth. This is a picture at the opening. Me, the director, or the CEO of the Queens Museum, Laura Reykjavik, the commissioner of sanitation, Catherine Garcia. And up the stairs in the back, Tom Finkel Pearl, who used to be the head of the museum and is now the commissioner of cultural affairs at that time who commissioned this whole four-year effort that turned into this exhibition. My inspiration comes from Psalm 90. So teach us to number our days so we may, be kept, so we may get a heart of wisdom. Establish the work of our hands. Personally, I would like this wall of time to become architecture, to become the external wall of, they, they could become tiles of a sanitation garage. This is a peace table and 16 peace chairs I designed the table and I designed the chairs with Robert Wilhite. It, it is connected, suspended from heaven. Cobalt blue stained glass with an empty center waiting for completion. There are three there were four, but I'm showing you images from three peace talks. This is a peace talk about pairs, public artists 
in residence that were inspired by my artist in residency in the sanitation department. You see two former commissioners, Norman Steisel and Brendan Sexton sitting next to each other, who I must say were the most heavy duty supporters of my art. I call this supers and supers. You see Robin Nagel, one of the um, uh, chair, chairs of creators of the whole discard studies conference and whole project uh, who, who uh, ran a, a peace talk between superintendents of sanitation garages and whole districts meeting their counterpart. They from the outside to the inside, the supers of buildings who are responsible for getting those recyclables out on the sidewalk so sanitation can pick them up. Supers and supers. They had never met each other, even though they work together all the time through being part of an artwork in a museum. The museum can be a meeting place that doesn't exist elsewhere. And finally, a peace talk. Next, I'm sorry, next. Oh, this is another. It was, this was a talk of discovery of each other, listening to each other. The final um, peace talk called Care as Culture. Many, many different kinds of artists, writers, curators, talking about the museum as the fulcrum of transformation. Art, redeeming this land, stuffed with material rejections, redeemed by those who made it, individual by individual. 1999 and ongoing. This is a proposal for 1 million people to participate in an artwork for Fresh Kills Park. Public offerings made by all, redeemed by all. I want to show you part of my vision for Fresh Kills. I call it an intergenerational project. Nineteen seventy nine, the bad old days. The image from Touch Sanitation was in the Whitney Biennial many years ago, part of a group collaboration by group with group, a group called Group Materials. Two thousand five. Now it is becoming a unique environmental urban park. Some of my guiding principles for Fresh Kills Park. Fresh Kills Park can be a symbol of our power to create transformation of the land. Two, Fresh Kills Park needs to reconnect to all those who made it in the first place. This is the whole site, 2,200 acres, and this will be a public artwork for this whole entire site. In December, 2021, the Department of Sanitation's Engineering Department completed decades of environmental closure of all four mounds, north, east, south, west at Fresh Kills, a great world-class achievement. Now is the time to shift, turning Fresh Kills into a healthy 
public park. Over 50 years, millions of people in New York City threw out over 150 million tons of garbage. This created the four mounds of fresh kills. It is truly a social sculpture. This is sanitation's own map with every street on it. They know where you are. They have to, or they can't come find your garbage. How does a place switch its meaning and become something else? I believe this site cannot be transformed into something else, no matter how beautiful it becomes. And it is already becoming beautiful. Unless many of us who made it actively and personally attempt to renew it. These acts must attain a, a whiff of similar scale, like the original scale of material rejections. I propose a million. Donor citizens are invited to create something of great personal value or to select something of great personal value. I call these public offerings. These material objects must fit into the size of the possessing hand. These offerings are voluntarily released, yes, but not rejected. They are not abject. Their value stays with them. Rather, they are released to be shared in community. Fresh Kills Landfill, 150 million tons of material rejections created by billions of individual rejections redeemed by 1 million offerings to be shared. How will 1 million offerings happen? The offerings are gathered, scaled up, and transferred to the city at cultural transfer stations. This is New York City with some of the cultural transfer stations marked. These are participating public sites of meeting. They will become workshops all over the city prepared to receive offerings from each hand that offers. What are actual cultural transfer stations? Traditional, traditional cultural sites such as museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a public institution owned by the city of New York and other museums in all the boroughs. And new kinds of cultural sites, such as sanitation facilities. Here is a sanitation transfer station, also becoming a cultural transfer station. This was committed to me many years ago by former sanitation commissioner, John Dougherty. The donor citizen releases the offering to the city. Then each offering will be photo documented, registered, then embedded in a transparent recycled glass block that becomes the housing for the offering. The relationship formed between the donor citizen and the city through the process of release and acceptance, then transfer and exchange is symbolized by a unique barcode given as a receipt to each donor. This barcode is also engraved as part of the glass blocks design. 
it becomes a repository of decodable information about the donor's identity and intention. As well, the barcode is the key for entry to a global web archive. It, it records, classifies, and locates the coordinates of each offering at the site, each of one million. Here is an example of an embedded offering. Eventually, when the site is ready, the offerings in their glass blocks will be placed at the new Fresh Kills Park, embedded as markers that this place has changed. Glass is used because it will last for thousands of years. One million offerings will become edges of path. Guess how many miles of path? About 50 miles of paths and vertical surfaces all around the 2200 acre site. The barcode read by a visitor's smartphone or found on the global archive will enable generations afterwards to discover the intention of the makers of these material objects, which insist on their individual value. It will also be used to explore the site on special expeditions to find specific offerings, a million. Thus, it is the people who originally made this land over 50 years through acts of material rejection and separation. Those people can renew this land for themselves and for all of us into the future. The act of release without rejection into an abject flux. A release to share a personal public offering is the act of taking the power to transform into one's own hands. This new permanent citywide land layer, kissing the surface, now entering the public domain will be a huge flow force revealing a new kind of reverence. Reverence for the individual's intention, respect for the material, even though released from private ownership. Reverence for this land on which it sits. This new city land garden can be treasured. Again, the whole site, north, east, south, west, the biggest municipal landfill in the world, There's a tragic layer here. On this image was taken in August 2020, 2001. And the, a month later, these two World Trade Center towers collapse. Their remains are buried on the West Mound at Fresh Kills. It changes the meaning of a public place. This is my site in the South Park, accepted uh, for my Percent for Art project by Sanitation Parks and the Department of Cultural Affairs in 2008. I'm standing on the land bridge between two um, points of the South Park. I invite you one day to come to be on landing. It will be a cantilevered overlook over and creation of an intersection so that you can look at the future as the waters rise during the climate crisis. 62 feet out over the tidal inlet, 
you see the ancient original landscape of Staten Island in the wetlands. And beyond, you can see clearly for two miles here, the development of the one mile long East Park landfill, one of the mounds uh, transformed by the end of engineering closure into a safe place. You can be like a bird flying, flying, choosing to land, to face the future, to see the future. And you'll be surrounded by two earthworks, mostly purple flowers. Those were the favorites of paleo Indians who lived here 10,000 years ago. This is a book called An Incomplete Archive of Activist Art. I was commissioned uh, to create um, a piece. I named it With. It is a proposal for a performance artwork in the United States Capitol. Inspiration from the Manifesto of Maintenance Art 1969 proposal for an exhibition care. Quote, after the revolution, who's going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning? Introduction, the events begun on January 6th, 2021 are turning into two stories. One story is the attack an insurrection by thousands of mostly white supremacists violently breaching and vandalizing and publicly defecating on to soil the United States Congress while threatening its members whose workplace this is, who were forced into hiding while they were in the midst of preparing to vote on the essential decision to accept and certify the results of the pres presidential election of November 2020. Besides causing the chaos that resulted in deaths and subsequent suicides and grave injuries to many, including officers of the Capitol Police, its key searing image blaring out in the torrent of frenzied chaos is the arrival and waving of the Confederate flag, symbol of the lost war of slavers of black and brown Americans, suddenly arisen, resurrected, and planted within the interior spaces of this essential symbol of American democracy. Action to this action. The other story is what happened right afterward. The maintenance staff of the Capitol went to work immediately throughout the entire building to wash away, to remove, to clean, to repair, to restore. They did the kinds of skilled tasks that they always do, only now transforming these awesome areas that had been turned into a war zone to return them to a state of constant daily purity. No matter that the mess they were working in and through had also become a deeply personally insulting atmosphere aimed at their own humanity. Nevertheless, they went to work, key image, and worked tirelessly to return the capital through shit and filth and shattering back to the people's house to heal the sacred space immediately. Two opposite stories, two opposite key images. 
I note, as Isabel Wilkerson, the author of Cast, has pointed out, all the masked maintenance workers were black and brown people, unquote. Virtually all the unmasked attackers were white. Set in the aftermath of these two stories, between these soul-piercing images, this is a proposal for a site-specific artwork. With is a performance artwork that will take place during regular working hours at the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. The living artwork occurs as a series of performance actions throughout the Capitol building while Congress is in session. There are three people who create each performance action. They form a trio. The maintenance worker, this person is a member of the regular maintenance staff of the United States Capitol. Second, the maintenance artist, me. Three, the individual member of Congress, a representative or a senator. Participation by each person, as it is an artwork, is voluntary. Critical preliminaries. First, there will be a long and intense research period. My meeting the maintenance workers in all their work categories to show examples of my over 50 years of making art dealing with maintenance and service work and workers all over the world. I will explain that my intention has always been to bring their work out front, not done behind the scenes after, quote, everyone went home, so that their work became seen holistically as an essential part of culture, not merely its enabler. From the workers, I need them to teach me who they are, their schedules, and the structure, interrelationships, and organizations of their work systems. This will take a long time. This then learning is followed by an expectedly excruciating period of negotiations that includes delicate negotiations with the workers, their unions, building managers, the capital security hierarchy, members of both houses of Congress to gain permission for access to use locations throughout the Capitol, to establish possible sizes of performance areas and durations for each performance trio. No doubt these negotiations will also take a long time. Various parts of this will be filmed with the approval of the workers directed by the artist. Then the performance itself, the performance actions of the whole array of trios composed by different workers and different members of Congress in each should occur throughout the entire building. This will be filmed in its entirety with the approval of the participating workers and members directed by the artist. The performance has two parts, a kernel, an art essence with the maintenance artist, me, and an expansion to be described below. As I usually have done in large performances, I write a letter of invitation to participate to each worker. Here is my letter to a Capitol worker. Dear United States Capitol Maintenance and Service Worker, First, let me thank you for your heroic work reviving the United States People's House after the violent attack on it of January 6, 2021. I want to make an artwork in this, your workplace, to manifest my awe and respect for your never-ending work to keep this sacred space a living entity. I would do this in normal, regular times too, 
but I urgently need to do this with you now because you are the symbol of all that is heroic in our democracy. Nothing stops you. Nothing, no matter how foul and insulting to you personally, has stopped you from bringing back this place. This is amazing and we should all celebrate your work. Here is the Colonel. What I propose to do with you as a performance artwork called With. First, we would meet and I would ask you about all your different kinds of work tasks and invite you to see examples of my work over 50 years all over the world created by workers like you. The performance I invite you to participate in consists of many performance art actions that happen throughout the U.S. Capitol during regular work hours while Congress is in session. There will be three people in each performance action. They constitute what I call a trio. They are you, the maintenance worker, me, the maintenance artist, three, a member of Congress, the witness to your expertise, and then the audience. Space will be made to include visitors to the Capitol, members and staff passing by, and other maintenance workers passing by. Here's what happens if you agree to participate. You do your regular work, you don't explain, you just carry on with your regular work. I, as artist, tie myself to you, the worker, not too close to interfere with your work, but connected in some way. Then the tie could be a rope, perhaps a beautiful woven satin rope. Each of us would have a belt with a carabiner. The connecting material, the tie, would be knotted to each carabiner. If you cannot stand a physical rope, then we, we would agree on a specific distance that I would maintain between, a, between us throughout the action. Basically, I will follow in your footsteps. I don't do the work. I will copy your work as accurately as I can. My desire in this artwork is for a picture to arise between us. You do your work how you do it. My goal is to copy the work gestures of your hands, the pitch of your body, how you know how to use your strength to power through all your tasks. I, without tools, through gestures of my hand, hands, and my body, I will try to draw and to engrave the movements of your expertise and to capture your very style in the air. There it will hover for a moment between us, then pass just like the beauty and devotion of your work appears and then evaporates from moment to moment to be repeated and repeated just as the breath of life that you release as you keep working. We don't speak. This happens in every place where your work occurs for it is you and this work that has revived and is now keeping this, our sacred site of democracy, alive. The third participation in the trio is a member of Congress. I invite this person to be a witness to your work that has re re returned this place to usefulness so that the Congress person can continue working to allow the people's business to happen. The member who was threatened by the invasion on January 6th is invited to walk with us, be with us. We all belong together. 
We are the kernel. For each action, there is a different worker and a different member of Congress. I hope to meet you soon. Yours, Merrill Laterman Eucles, Maintenance Artist. Who cares? How long do we have? Do we have to take care? For forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meryl, for that incredibly powerful talk. Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Eugenia Kissen, anthropologist of art at NYU Gallatin, who's gonna make a couple of short comments. Welcome, Eugenia. Thank you so much, Rossi. Um, and, and thank you, Meryl, for your incredibly moving talk. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so we have so many questions in the q and I'm just gonna be really brief. Um, and in true anthropologist fashion, um, notice three things about your talk that I thought were incredibly important. Um, and really speak to this problem of how we navigate the terrain of the public and the private, um, the stakes of which you made so clear, um, talking about both your work at Fresh Kills and this proposal for how we actually care about democracy um, and how we care for that. So the first thing I noticed um, right from the beginning of your talk, I think it's so significant that you brought Pollock, Rothko, and Duchamp into this genealogy, right? So that it continues to be um, an interdependence and vulnerability that isn't just the responsibility of feminist artists. Um, so I think that that continues to be really important and inspiring as part of this intergenerational project, um, that it goes backwards as well. The second thing um, about care. So um, one of the things that I've been trying to think a lot about is how we can care um, with art in ways that don't um, undo all of the sort of privacy and dignity of workers involved in this. And I know that you have cared about and fretted about this question and this ambivalence for, for your entire career. Um, and so I think that one of the answers that I that I really saw today in the story that you told about um, the man who gave you the industrial rags during the washing um, performance, I think that the sort of quietness of that moment and the fact that he just said here um, is is actually a way that that kind of privacy in interdependence is maintained. Um, so that's the second thing. And then finally, um, there was such an elegance to so many of your words, um, the twirling, the flow, the falling. Um, and I think that that's another way that the kind of playfulness and dignity of, of your work with others is maintained. So thank you so much for your talk. I'm gonna pass things over to Keith so that we can hopefully open it up for a discussion. Eugenia, I, I look forward to meeting you in public and 3D, three dimensions. <laughs> I hope one day we can meet. Me too. Thank you. Keith. Hi, yeah. Merle. How are Keith. you doing? So good to see you. I'm happy so to see you. <laughs> Likewise, I'm so sad that we're not in person. Um, before I start, I just want to say how great it has been to work with you and what an honor and how moving your talk is. Um, like Eugenia said, there's a lot of questions in the uh, chat, and those are much more interesting. But I'm as I was listening, I... I uh, was immediately struck by the thing that has always struck me most about first your work and then working with you directly, um, which is the deep humanity within it and the openness to it. You know, your gesture of this and you can always say no and you can always say yes. That that quote that you have is really moving. And I um, I just, I really wanna to get to the question. So I'm gonna keep this short. And I just wrote down a couple of words that you used. And I think it's so indicative of your work and the process of it. And like the word offering and renewal and care and release without rejection and listening and invitation and then gift. 
And I think it made, it reminded me of Lewis Hyde's book, The Gift. I don't know if you read that. And, and his idea of the gift is something that one gives without any thought of return. And that kind of open gesture that is really about care and in the deepest sense. And I think that what you bring to your work, and, and I love having the show in the gallery because you see how long you sit with the artists, with the uh, maintenance work, workers in each of the different pieces, how you're just really listening. And you can tell whether it's the guys in 1979 or the Japanese snowplow workers in, in 2012, how much they really are conscious of this very unique experience that they don't often get given. And so for me, like your talk represented that, the generosity of spirit and the gift of giving that is built into it. And I feel like it's really so unique that you did that at a moment when artists were rethinking the modernist paradigm of kind of ego-based heroism. And you really went totally the opposite way. And you said, I'm going to do something that's not heroic. I'm going to face this outward and listen. And I think that's why you're a hero to so many of the younger artists and the artists of today's generation who are working. And, you know, the, the quotes that are, uh, I'll let uh, Razi take over the Q&A, that are in the Q&A are all about that kind of enthusiasm for your generosity and the gift of your work that you've been. So thank you so much for that. And thanks for such a beautiful talk. Thank you, Keith. Tomorrow's the end. Yes, I know. I'm Tomorrow. too sad about it. I can't, <laughs> can't even mention it. So, uh, but there will be another time. So, and we'll see you in person here. Well, thank you so much, Keith and Eugenia. Um, and if uh, people in the audience want to post questions or comments, uh, we will go a little bit over time. Um, uh, so we've got a few more minutes. I'll read a couple of comments and then a couple of questions. First comment from Sarah Nahar says, this was so moving. I was hanging diapers on the line and cleaning for a while during the lecture, but just thinking about the woman, woman manifesto, I just sat down and rested. And then we've got a comment from Robin Nagel. Ah, Merle, your work always brings such powerful combination of joy, tears, and hope. Um, then we've got a question here from Aviva Rahmani. In the face of current repressions, do you think young artists today can source the same scale of courage that made your vision possible in the 60s and 70s? Yes, always. <laughs> uh, let me, uh, so do you want me to ask, answer something? Um, uh, I mean, we, we, we can, I can hand you a few questions at a time, or you can go ahead. I would say go ahead and answer, you know, if you like. Well, I, I, I do want to respond to dear Aviva, who is a, a friend over decades, who has struggled and continues to struggle to make very big scale, big scale public work. Um, so we share that, a very frustrating job. Um, but actually, I think in the 70s, um, maybe it was the fiscal crisis in New York or the Vietnam War, the sort of the discouragement by uh, so many young people, myself included, of institutions, of the way things were supposed to be, that we just hit the streets. And we just did, if we wanted to do something, we did it. And that unleashed a kind of big, uh, big scale and small scale and personal and intimate, but not sticking in categories. Um, we just, you know, going inside became suspect. Uh, the street, we felt we, we owned the streets and the work took place a lot in the streets. Um, so I think that we live in such an insane time right right now. Uh, no time to describe what I'm talking about. <laughs> that I think that the level of, of frustration that many, many young, I know many, many young artists feel um, will actually empower them to hit something, streets or whatever, or the uh, and speak out, and speak out at whatever scale 
uh, they're interested in. I think it it will be a things are so bad that I think people will think what the hell and step out and take uh, big chances. I hope so. Thanks for that. Um, Eva Peskin writes, thank you so much for your work, for keeping me as an artist alive with your model of interdependent public creative practice. Can you speak more on how you think about or work with duration? How do you relate to such long-term processes differently over time? How do these projects stay lively for you as they unfold slowly over many years? How do you notice other participants, volunteers, affected by the long time it takes to do maintenance art? Yes. <laughs> that's a lot, that's a lot of big, long question. Actually, I must tell you the older I get, when I was younger, when I started doing this stuff, I was uh, much more patient. Now I'm 83 and I'm not so patient. I don't, I don't have such a long time horizon in front of my eyes. Um, and I know from being around city government a lot, a long, long, long time, there can be people who can take a risk and say yes and try. And there can be a lot of people who are scared for one reason or another and they know very well how to say no or cause things to slow down um, and increase unnecessarily increase the duration of something. Th many things can happen quicker if people will be willing to take a risk and try and think in a larger way so that duration itself isn't necessarily a value, I think. And I'm saying that even though a lot of my work is packed with duration and frustration, and I think a lot of it is stupid and doesn't have to, frankly, does not have to take so long at all. It just needs people who are in positions of saying yes or no to say, what the hell, I'll say yes. That happened to me in sanitation. They didn't have, they, they, there was no precedent. They did not have to deal with me. They could have said bye. They didn't, they didn't have to deal with me at all. Many people went to great lengths to enable me to do many, many projects actually. Step forward and it happened. But a lot of things don't have to take so damn long. It's ridiculous. And I think an artist should never accept that duration is a sort of a sacred ritual. <laughs> because sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. Thanks for that. Uh, Martine Handelman Duffy writes, Incredibly powerful, moving, and radical work here. How do you think that the advent of technology and increasing automation of labor will affect issues of maintenance and care? Wow. Uh, it's a great, great, it's a great question. Um, automation um, has eliminated uh, many, many jobs. Um, in some ways, it's very good that a lot of jobs are unnecessarily dangerous if they could be made more safe through technology. That's wonderful. But replacing uh, human judgment, um, human, um, I learned a lot of things in sanitation, um, being especially around operations people, where really on the one hand, 
the work is repetitive, incredibly repetitive, often incredibly boring, yet necessary. I learned um, uh, endurance, a kind of endurance quality uh, from a lot of operations people, workers, officers, uh, officials who who didn't turn away from difficult situations. They went into them and stayed there. Um, the th the thought that the that this can be replaced by machines, although someone has to take care of the machines, you know. Um, I don't know. It's a it's a it, I don't I don't really have good a, a good answer. It's a big question. Here's a here's big. another one from August Ackley. Are there any artists whose work you look to for inspiration? And are there any contemporary artists working now who you feel are who you feel are building on your legacy? <laughs> I um I look at I look at a lot of I don't look an, at an, as much art as I would love to look at. I teach um, at Betzalel, the MFA program in Tel Aviv. I love seeing my students over a period of two years uh, changing, growing, developing. Um, I admire a lot of work and I don't like a lot of work also. I think that it's um, uh, people are scaredy cats. I don't like that. Um, I admire many, many artists. I, that's it. So there was a correction that was actually a question from Nina Osoria Ahmadi, who apparently is using the computer of August Ackley. Um, we have another question here from. Mril Ingram. Thank you, oh. thank you, Mril, for this talk and so much more. Here's a question I've had for a while. In one of your videos I found online, you are shown walking past our Sarah's tilted arc when it was still in place. What do you want us to think about when we see you next to that large, disruptive, provocative artwork? Well, so first of all, my, my first name is M Meryl, Meryl. And her name is Muriel. And I've been trying to get her. I, she wrote about me in a beautiful book that she just published. Um, I've been trying to get her to reveal where, where does her name come from? But she hasn't, she hasn't, I have never met her. I was supposed to meet her when this was gonna be a live event and she came to the conference, but I unfortunately wasn't able, wasn't able to meet anyone. I was locked up in isolation. Um, tilted, I, I, I'm, something just happened um, this, just the other day uh, about Tilted Arc, actually. The uh, storefront for art and architecture just sell an, an, a wonderful institution in New York City, just celebrated its 40th anniversary. And part of the celebration they they brought out back a show that Tom Finkelpearl and Glenn Weiss created 40 years ago after Tilted Arc, assuming what uh, asking many, 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 I think like the 40 artists or something, asking them what were they going to do after Tilted Arc was taken down. And I made a, a, a different kind of proposal that that Tom published on Facebook. You can see it on an in Instagram or Facebook. I don't, I don't remember which one. Um, where I said that don't touch that arc, don't touch tilted arc, even though it's a pretty mean sculpture. That 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 many people didn't like. Um, however, it passed all the, the uh, regulations to, to have a contract to be built. And if you touch, if you take down 
the public artwork, then you must take down the federal office building behind it as well. Because if one contract does isn't honored, then you shouldn't honor the other contract. So that made people think, wow, we're not doing we're not doing that. So I propose leave the sculpture alone, even if people dislike it, and move to the um uh, pool, a very large pool on one side of the of the tilted arc and turn it into an amphitheater easily. You add steps, just, uh, you know, rings of steps because the pool never, ever worked anyhow, wouldn't make any bit of difference. It was just like, a, you know, a, a architect's fantasy pool that nobody ever turned on or made anything happen there. Make it an amphitheater and have the federal government fund ongoing discussion about what is public art? What is the right of the artist? What is artistic freedom? What is democracy? That's what I said. So you can, you don't destroy, you shift the meanings of the context, change the context. And I think he he was very uh, positive. I, I wish that that had happened. I think that could have easily happened. Thanks for that. Uh, I think we have time just for one more question. Um, and I apologize to those whose questions we, we haven't gotten to. You can certainly write to uh, the artist um, and pose them directly. Takako Ito says, thank you for your wonderful talk, Meryl. I'm deeply impressed by your art. Do you feel that the public reaction to your artistic production has changed significantly between the 60s and 70s and now? I think so. What is the public now in the United States has become so fraught. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> Who is the public? You know, what is the public? Um, I was very, very fortunate to be a commission um, to have this 50 year career survey show at the Queens Museum, they every uh, possible place for exhibiting art was turned over for for this exhibition. So and 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 people worked. Um, they didn't have the biggest staff in the world, but people of the staff were so devoted toward making this very large exhibition happen. So that the re the change from the Whitney sending me one half of a lousy piece of paper saying, don't even talk to us. I guess that shows it. That was in 1971. And the Queens Museum who turned itself inside out, upside down, backwards and forwards, work on the roof, work on all sides of the museum, public programs, um, about for my work, I guess that's that says uh, that there's a certain uh, uh, change, basic change. And actually, the Whitney bought one of my works and showed it in a wonderful exhibition. <laughs> they didn't turn over the whole museum though, like they should have done, but whatever. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. That was such an incredibly rich uh, talk and Q&A and comments. And we really just missed you here in New York, but it's so wonderful to have- I miss you too. <laughs> to engage with you and, and just thanks again. I wish you could hear a huge round of applause now. But... <laughs> uh, Rosie, I know that you do work in Senegal where meanings of material has changed radically. I wish we could talk about that. Um, Let's so that, that you see mm -hmm. the meaning of material 
and the flows of material changing, changing from when you began your work. How many years was that? 20 years. Mm -hmm. 20 years, night and day. Mm -hmm. um, not less complicated at all, right? Right, right. Just yeah. different, but different, mm -hmm. different meanings. Um, so I, 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 I want to express my appreciation for this institution that you had, this web that you people have created of discard studies uh, that brings together people like you, Robin, me, Keith, um, I think that we're working on uh, very important issues in our own different ways. Max, yeah. Yeah. Uh, love listening mm -hmm. to this incredible conference that you people put together. Incredible, a, a huge swath of different ways to close up, far back, big scales, intimate scale. So impressive. I'm I'm so proud and thrilled that I have been part of this. Well, you're iconic for us. So it was really an honor uh, to have your your work up and to get to hear from you finally. Uh, we couldn't have we couldn't have done this without you. Uh, so I'm just so appreciative. Thank you. Of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And we will have a further conversation offline um, about all of these issues. And I'm sure many people will be reaching out to you, but we want to thank uh, our collaborators here at Gallatin and the audience that stuck with us and my students, some of whom are here um, and, and to you, Merrill, thank you so much. I do, I, I do want to say a special word um, to Keith Miller, the, the curator. We, we, planned several different shows. It's It's gone through a lot of different uh, states of being. Um, and he has been a joy to work to work with and really extended himself. I was not in New York most, most of the time and, and COVID and lockdowns and God knows so hard. And he just made it happen. I'm just... It was a privilege to work with Keith, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you so much.